Thanks for tuning in to more NFL Draft Talk on the Our Lads Football Network as we talk Miami Dolphins football inside Our Lads NFL depth charts following the 2021 NFL Draft. Alan Poupard joins us from Sports Illustrated. Alan, how's everything going? Everything is going very well. Thank you, Greg. How are you? Good. I, I miss my Expos hat. Yeah, they'll make a return. Don't worry. Yeah, well. I, I, I noticed that the Dolphins have a Canadian in their draft class. Yes, they do. And a good one, too. So it works out, works out even better. going to have to find out. That's it. Make sure that's one of your first questions. Did you – well, he's probably too young to be an Expo fan. Yeah, probably. Uh, when, when, I, when I get a chance to talk to him one-on-one when we get out of the Zoom world for interviews, uh, I'll be talking some Expos baseball maybe. <laughs> but he's probably, probably too young to be an Expo fan. Yeah, yeah. probably. All right, let's get right to it. The Miami Dolphins, uh, we talked before the draft uh, about the trade and, 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 and everything, and we've gone through the whole offseason and even the end of the season after we had our weekly shows uh, talking about the quarterback situation. But we know now that's set with Tua being the man. And then the Dolphins go out and use up their first pick and acquire the speedster, Jalen Waddell, the former Tua, Alabama teammate. Uh, so the Dolphins... Uh, they, they basically, it looks like they get the player they wanted. Uh, Pierce, I, I mean, they made it very clear after the draft that this is a guy that they had their eye on for quite a while and that he brings something to the office that was sorely missing, and that's the ability to take a routine play and turn into a long game quickly and easily. Somebody like the Tyre. Kill that style in terms of his uh, build. He's not quite as compact and as stocky as Hill is, but in terms of his play style, that's what he is. You can use him in a lot of different ways. Jet sweep, quick screen, quick slant, and let him use his speed to, to work his magic. And that's going to help the offense, and it's going to help to Otongo Vailoa because throwing the ball downfield at this point is not necessarily his forte. He needs guys who can make things happen after the catch. Yep. And that's what they get in Waddle. Do you believe, because we had talked about Kyle Pitts potentially being, the, if he was available, uh, do, do you still believe that the Dolphins, that for, for the Dolphins, that was their top choice if they could have had an opportunity to get him? That's a fabulous question. Um, I, I think very possibly what they figured is making the trades from three to 12 to six that they were equally enamored with Pitts and with Waddle because of what they could do for Tua and for their offense, and that they would have been perfectly happy with either one, probably realizing at that point that it was more likely that Waddle would be available at six and Pitts. Yeah. And I certainly don't sense that there was any regret that they didn't wound up losing out on Pitts. Yeah, it looks like – well, it was – really Atlanta was the team that was holding the cards at that point. And if they went with a quarterback, then maybe Pitts is available – uh, but like you said, if the Dolphins were that enamored with Pitts, then they don't trade down. Then they make sure they get him. So. Correct. And I'm not 100% convinced that had Atlanta gone quarterback and Cincinnati stayed with Jamar Chase as they did, that the Dolphins wouldn't have picked Waddle anyway. Um, okay. Not sure. I, I think they're very, very happy, again, because of what he represents yep. and what he does for that offense. And also, and it's interesting because you look at Waddle's ability in the return game, that maybe even in year one could end up being just as important because it might take, you know, like any rookie, it might take him a year or two to kind of get his game going like a re- regular pro receiver. Uh, but the return game is a little bit different return game, man. You just, you catch, I mean, you get that ball and you just go. And I get the feeling that he's going to be a, a weapon in that department. Yeah. And I would make the case also that his style of play probably doesn't require as much refinement once you get to the NFL because it, it's so based on his speed. Um, I mean, he's going to be – he was much faster than pretty much any DB he ever faced in college, and he's going to be faster than practically every cornerback he's going to face in the NFL. So I don't think that the adjustment period is going to be quite as big for him as for your more prototypical wide receiver, maybe even Jamar Chase, maybe, maybe even Demont- Devontae Smith that we heard so much about pre-draft. And absolutely – He's going to help in the return game and in the process kind of make Jakeem Grant 
who already gave the Dolphins a dynamic returner before that. Now Jakeem Grant becomes a little bit irrelevant because uh, Waddle's just as explosive as a returner and Jakeem Grant just hasn't developed as hoped as a wide receiver. Yeah, because now, of course, the Dolphins acquired Will Fuller. So now it's Parker, Fuller, Waddle, and uh, Preston Williams is going to be the wild card because it's, it's about getting him healthy. So more than anything. Correct. No, and, and there was a lot of talk before the draft of like the Dolphins – Wide receiver, wide receiver core is really weak. And to me, I was like, no, it's not. It's actually very deep. Yeah, They got a lot of NFL caliber receivers. What they didn't have was a dynamite, dynamic number one guy because Parker's always hurt. Uh, if you could assure me that Parker would be healthy like he was in 2019 when he played all 16 games, well, guess what? That year, he led all AFC wide receivers in receiving yards and receiving touchdowns. That's pretty much a number one wide receiver, yes. except he's always hurt. So now in the offseason, they added Fuller and Jalen Waddle. So. That's actually interesting that you bring that up because if you look at it, Parker's had some issues with staying healthy. We know Will Fuller's had issues staying healthy. Waddle had some issues staying healthy. And Preston Williams can't stay healthy. So uh, th- that's why the more of these guys you can put a- into this deep unit, the better in case a couple of guys can't stay healthy. And that just shows you why maybe even a Grant – uh, and, uh, you know, Ford's still there, Malcolm Perry, Lynn Bowden. I mean, these are all guys that are going to still be important depth pieces in case, you know, they're they're not a completely healthy unit. But that just shows you, too, you know, Bowden and Perry especially, you know, they can line up anywhere. And it's going to be interesting to find out what the last cuts are going to be. Because, again, as you mentioned, not only is it a deep position overall, but when you add Bowden and Perry, guys like that, who can fit a, a variety of roles, and then you draft Dokes, the team, the Dolphins drafted Dokes in round seven, uh, and the team drafted Hunter Long in, in, in the third round. Now, all of a sudden, you have some very interesting camp battles. And don't forget the two guys who opted out last year, Albert Wilson and Alan Hearns, yes. who are both solid pros. And in Wilson's case, another guy who's had to deal with injuries. So, no, they have, yeah, they're going to have a lot of camp battles. And then th- th- you mentioned the selection of Hunter Long. Well, he joins a tight end core that already had Mike Gesicki, Durham Smythe, Adam, Adam Shaheen, yeah. who are maybe not great tight ends, but Gesicki has become a very good receiving tight end. Uh, I, and I can't help but think that that move was made with 2022 in mind because Gesicki and Smythe both are headed into their contract okay. year, both scheduled to be UFAs next offseason because, quite frankly, un- un- unless you, may- you mentioned the adjustment period for Waddle, it's the same for Hunter Long. It's even more pronounced for a tight yep. end. So how realistically, if the Dolphins have the same guys on the roster at tight end, what kind of quick impact can we realistically expect Long to make? And they played uh, three tight ends a lot. Matter of fact, Shaheen, the number three tight end, played 34% of the snaps. That's 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 a lot average NFL-wise for your third tight end. Uh, Smythe, he caught 89% of the passes thrown to him, which is really fantastic. I don't even care who it is, especially since he, he, he hauled in 26 passes. So that just shows you he wasn't the downfield threat, of course, that – uh, Gesicki was, but still, it just shows you the depth that they have now at that position as well. And and let's keep fans, let's make sure they understand Hunter Long, Boston College. I think you get the perception, tight end, Boston College, man, he must be a really good blocker. He's going to have to learn how to be a receiver. That's not the case with Hunter Long. That's like the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. No, correct. And then, yeah, because you mentioned Smythe. Smythe's thing is he's by far the best blocking tight end on the team. He might be the only one you would classify as a good blocking tight end. Gesicki's the receiving guy. Hunter Long is maybe somewhere in between. And Shaheen's got a little bit of both, but he's not on Smite's level as a blocker, and he's not on Gesicki's level as a receiver. To me, it was just a very weird pick if you're looking strictly at 2021 because I, I thought they absolutely had zero need for a tight end unless they were going to take Kyle Pitts because Kyle Pitts yeah, is special. such a freakish yes. athlete. That, that's, uh, that's what I thought. But yeah. outside of that, yeah, no, that yeah, that picks a prize. Yeah. That's the one. Because that's, that's what we talked about. It was like, hey, Pitts, they, didn't, they don't need a tight end, but hey, a guy like this doesn't come along very often. And then lo and behold, they go ahead and use a, uh, a, a pretty high draft pick on a tight end anyway. Maybe it was just one of those things where Long was just clearly the best player available. 
Could have been. And it seemed to be kind of how they, they approached their draft. So I, I can see that. And again, if you're looking at a roster building maneuver yes. with, with a big view, then it makes sense. Because when you're down the road, they may not have yeah. either Smite or Gasecki or Burry either. All right. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's, I'll tell you what, stay on offense because the team then added uh, the tackle Eichenberg from Notre Dame. And he's not an athlete, but that's okay, uh, which is not a surprise coming from Notre Dame on the offensive line. But still, you know, these guys are usually pretty smart, and he is. He's a smart kid, very strong, you know, the blue collar type. Uh, is he going to be punched in, do you think, at guard? Do you, do you see? Because I get the feeling that with his, his strengths being more of a power guy, you don't want to expose him on the outside too much. Do you think that's what happens and they keep Robert Hunt at right tackle? That's a great question. Or do they swing Eichenberg, guard tackle, and he doesn't start and DJ Fluker starts at right tackle with Robert Hunt sliding inside at right guard? Or do they keep Robert Hunt at right tackle? Or do they put Jesse Davis into the mix? The, the thing is they have – a whole bunch of options yeah. there in terms of the right side. Um, Solomon Kidley, for example, started at a right, at right guard last year, was playing well until he started having foot issues. Well, he played left guard his last year at Georgia. Dolphins got rid of Eric Flowers. So now, very logic, logically, maybe they move Solomon Kidley back to left guard. They can, And again, then on the right side, they have so many options. They can... It's, it's Eichenberg, Fluker, and Robert Hunt, who logically, and Jesse Davis, who figure into the mix with those four guys. All four of them can play guard or tackle. I tend to be surprised they would stick Eichenberg there as a rookie at right tackle, yeah. who would then be protecting two as blindside. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening. I see actually maybe more Eichenberg beginning his career as a backup, Fluker starting at right tackle, and Robert Hunt starting at right guard. That would be my guess. Um, or it could be vice versa. It could be Hunt at right tackle, Fluker at right guard. I don't know. But, yeah. yeah, they have so many different options. And that's good. That's what you want, and especially on the offensive line. Right. The team also drafted Coleman in round seven, and their top – correct me if I'm, wrong, um, if I'm wrong, but I believe their top college undrafted signing was Robert Jones. Because, see, he, our lads gave him a sixth-round grade, right. the kid from Middle Tennessee – uh, he played tackle mm -hmm. the last couple of years at Middle Tennessee, but he is projected uh, to move inside as well. But uh, it just shows you more versatility. Yeah, if I'm being honest, you start talking about seventh round picks or UDFAs. For me, it's like uh, let's see what they Make have the and if they pan yeah. out great. But but I'm not I'm not talking about potential <laughs> dolphin scenarios and the lineups with with those guys in mind. And of course. Having said that, their starting running back is probably going to be Miles Gaskin, who two years ago was a seventh, seventh round pick. Yeah. So it shows you how much. I and and speaking of seventh round picks, Dokes comes into the perfect mm -hmm. situation where hey, he's seventh round pick. He made it. I think I have a chance. And we talked about the fact that the Dolphins didn't need a running back as as much as as people thought they did, based on how well they produced without having a star. Didn't mean it wouldn't be a great thing to have them, let's say, draft one of the top running backs in, with their with their second first round pick. But it wasn't a complete need, and now they go ahead and add Doke. So I think at least for this this season, I I think they're pretty I think they're pretty good shape. And of course, they signed Malcolm Brown. Well, I, I would have. Yeah, I would have told you it may not be a, a big need based on the philosophy of how they do things with their running back. Because you look at the analytics from last year, if you look at broken tackles or yards after contact, you will find Dolphin running backs near the bottom of the league. Uh, if we're being honest, they have a bunch of complimentary players. There's not a number one in there. And to me, if the Dolphins are going to go ahead and, and trade a third round pick next year to move up eight spots to pick Eichenberg, who's a very good prospect with a very solid floor, but a kind of a limited ceiling. I kind of think that maybe something could have been done to make the move to get ahead of Denver to get Javante Williams early in that second round, uh, who to me would represent a major upgrade over Miles Gaskin, Malcolm Brown, Savan Ahmed, Jared Dokes. Um, yeah, the Dolphins, just, I mean, you look just, at it, the just, Dolphins actually probably needed Williams more than Denver did. 
I mean, Denver has Melvin Gordon. I don't know what that says about Melvin Gordon's future in Denver, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. It shows you the different philosophies of both teams. No, I, correct. And I did a survey like around the league last year. I did research and the Dolphins, I think it was the Dolphins and Jacksonville maybe were the only teams in the NFL that did not have a running back on their roster who came into the NFL as uh, they didn't have anybody who came into the NFL higher than the fourth round pick okay. as, a, as a running back. Okay. Um, and Jacksonville struck gold with James Robinson as a UDFA. Yeah. But there's something to be said for pedigree. I mean, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I We'll have to see how that works out. But that that kind of one, if you, if you want to attack the for a reason or another, that would be one thing to look at. Yeah, because when I was looking over at the needs uh, myself and we had talked, I, I think the only – I think running back was probably at the top that wasn't – even though they did draft Dokes, uh, that wasn't really addressed early enough. And then the other one uh, we'll talk about a little later was on defense. But, you know, it's the same thing. I think this is what I think it identifies where the Miami Dolphins philosophy is on offense, just like I believe it, it kind of identified for me as a Jet fan how the Jets offense will be run. Some teams, some offenses just believe the running back position, not a priority. We're not going to use a top pick there. What's, 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 you know, we'll have a committee by backfield kind of approach. Uh, spend money elsewhere, that kind of thing. I didn't know as a Jet fan with a new offensive coordinator how they were going to do things. Now I do. Uh, Dolphins apparently seem the same way that they're going to, they're, that's the one p- spot on their roster they are not going to invest heavy dollars and heavy draft pick uh, capital on. So far. Oh, no question. And if, well, like, since they've been there, I mean, now yeah. that's the third year of the, of, of the Flow Greer regime and they haven't done yeah. it even going back to 2018, the first year. Uh, and it's kind of the New England model, uh, even though New England has spent a first-round pick on running backs at times with Lawrence Maroney and Sonny Michelle coming to mind. But even as the season starts, you usually see New England using three or yes. four guys. And they didn't work out, by the way. So Sonny Michelle's on his way yeah, out no. after this year, and Maroney was a bust. Correct. I mean, they were, they were okay, but uh, and maybe that's why – that's part of what stamped the philosophy even yeah. more. And where the Dolphins have spent a lot of money is on that wide receiver. They have spent a lot of money wide receiver. And again, if the idea is to maximize the talent around Tua and enhance his possibilities of developing as a quarterback uh, as much as possible, then I then certainly under, understandable. All right. Now uh, on defense, the team decided to add. Uh, an edge rusher with their second first round pick and they stayed with a local kid uh, from Miami. Uh, Phillips sat out 2019. And when he transferred, it was a perfect situation for him because he was dealing with the injuries. So he transfers, probably heals up his body, goes to Miami, takes the year off. And then it took a while for him to kind of get back into the flow after taking the year off. But then the last half of the season last year, he was a monster on the field one of the better defenders out there. So the big question is just going to be, he's got to refine his technique. Obviously he's got to stay healthy. Uh, but uh, that's what coaching is. That's what coaching is for, isn't it? No, I love that pick. I mean, that kid's a big time athlete. Uh, I mean, he looks the part and you see his highlight film when he's chasing down Trevor Lawrence from behind. Um, I think it's a big time move, and then the only reason he lasted to eighteen was because of the of the concussions he had at UCLA, yeah. and there are some other there are some other stuff that's out Maturity there about issues, quote yeah. unquote character that that yeah, but that's completely that's old. What I've what I've dived into it, it's it's old and it's bogus also, um, and the concussions. Yeah, ideally you'd like to have somebody who hasn't had two concussions prior to entering the NFL, but. Again, had he not had those, he wouldn't have been there at 18. All right, uh, Alan, let's also take a look at the second round pick, the second uh, player on defense uh, that the Dolphins added, uh, Javon Holland. This was the Canadian kid we talked about earlier. Opted out uh, for last season. Another premium special teams guy early on in his career, possibly. He was a very good punt returner at Oregon, but he's versatile. He really excelled as a nickel back in 2019. He could play corner. He can play nickel. 
Uh, he can play a, 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 a bunch of different positions. So that's going to really be a big advantage uh, for Miami. We just talked about the um, how flexible the offensive line can be. And that's exactly what the Dolphins have now in the secondary. The one position, though, that I thought that they were going to add that I mentioned before that they didn't was a corner. But they add Holland. And especially if Holland plays a lot of nickel, then that's pretty much, I think, what they were looking for anyway. Correct. And, and as far as corner is concerned, I, I think maybe their, their pick quote unquote was a pick last year with their third of three first round picks, Noah Benogany, who really didn't do a whole lot as a rookie. And maybe they're counting on him taking a big step and that, that takes care of that, of that need, so to speak. Um, no, I, here's the, the thing we talked about earlier about missing out on Javante Williams while well, getting Javon Holland at 36 to me is a pretty damn good consolation prize. And it makes me forget and it erases some of my bitterness because I really wanted Javante Williams because this is a guy, if he hadn't opted out in 2020, more than likely or a very good chance he'd have been a first round yes. pick. Fills a lot of roles. And if we think back to a couple of years ago, what did Brian Flores want to do with Minka Fitzpatrick? He wanted to move him around. That's right. Nickel, safety, corner. Well, maybe now he's got his guy and it's not going to go south. Holland's not going to balk at it. And it's a nice piece to have in the secondary. And, uh, and you mentioned the return of Billy on top of that. He's a ball hawk, nine picks in two years for a defense that thrived on takeaways last year. So, no, I really, really like that pick. Yeah. And, and in closing out, uh, you know, you look at it and, okay, we're not going to worry ourselves with uh, the two late offensive line guys. All right. Dokes might contribute. I don't think there's any question about that, even though it was a seventh round pick, but it, it's just interesting because when you, and I was looking at the RLED's depth chart and they have all the rookies in a different color. So you see how they kind of pop out. You know, the draft picks. And it's like, wow, they really only added a couple of guys on defense, in the draft and you know, added a few guys there, impact players. Don't get me wrong. Uh, in some of the guys that they added, but it wasn't like a draft. And this is what happens when you trade, when you trade out into the future, they don't really have, it wasn't a quantity draft to me. It seemed like a little bit more quality. Let's try, especially with Waddle and Phillips and Holland. Let's get some impact players early. But I think it's really smart that they now can look into the draft next year and be in a really good position again. And if you just keep doing that as an organization, that's, that's the difference between a winning organization and a losing organization. I just really like the way that Miami is running uh, things. And uh, it's been a long time since we've been able to say that. And, and since Miami Dolphin fans have been able to be proud of that. Well, they've been very methodical in their roster building since they, they, began this overhaul in 2019, accumulating all that draft capital. And they, they've had a plan in place and they've filled piece after piece after piece. And they've got a pretty good foundation right now. But the thing is, now they need for the, their early draft picks from the last couple of years from last year to take the next step and develop. Yes. Because last year you saw some signs out of some of those guys, but there was nobody. One guy made the all-rookie team and it was Raekwon Davis. Uh, at a position that's traditionally very, very low in terms of impact rookies, which is the interior of the defensive line. So you need a guy like Austin Jackson to take a big step. We mentioned Nick Benogany is another one. Uh, you could mention uh, Brandon Robert Jones, Hunt, even maybe? though he showed sign last Brandon Jones, and he showed flashes, but the biggest guy by far who needs to take a big step, who's going to overshadow everything else that's going to matter on this team is the quarterback. Oh, yeah. And regardless of what anything else happens, the Dolphins likely are going to go as far in 2021 as Tua can take them, and he's got to take a step forward. And the Dolphins have done a good job of giving him pieces to work with, specifically Will Fuller the fifth and Jalen Waddle. Yeah, I think I think you got in the NFL, you have to put your team in a position to to be one very good quarterback away from being a playoff and almost even a Super Bowl contender. Do you think the Dolphins are now in that position? And if not, what else do they have to do to be in that position? Again, if we're just, if, if Tua becomes the man, 
right now, let's just say he has an incredible year this year. What would be holding them back still, do you think? I'm not sure there is. If if but again, that's if Tua has an incredible year, that's be a pretty big leap from sure. last year because uh last year was meh. Yeah. Uh if Tua has a good year, the Dolphins make the playoffs. It, Dolphins if Tua has a great year, again, the question is going to be, can the defense repeat what it did last year in terms of producing takeaways? Because in terms of yardage allowed, they were, I believe, 20th or 21st in the league. So there was some work to be done there. But they were great on third down. They were great in the red zone. And they were great at takeaways. Uh, and they lost a couple of pieces. They lost Shaq, Shaq Lawson, who was big on playing time, didn't really make a major, a major impact. Mm -hmm. Kyle Van Noy actually was very solid for them. But they brought in Bernardrick McKinney, Jalen Phillips, who I think is going to make a huge impact, and Javon Holland, who's who's a nice piece of the secondary where, where they haven't lost anybody. So, yeah, no, I, they do have all the pieces in place. And the, the last remaining piece is for the quarterback to reach a level of good quarterback play, hopefully very good quarterback. Yeah, and, and again, I think that's the thing. That's what you need uh, is, is just can my – can my front office, my coaching staff, can 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 we can they put my team in a position to be a championship team as long as the quarterback takes them over the edge? And yeah, looks like the Dolphins are are, are really close to being in that position. And maybe they are. That's that's the thing. And and you don't know it sometimes until the quarterback becomes a star and then you lose the star. Then it's noticeable. Wow, I didn't realize how 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 bereft of talent my team really ha really was when the superstar quarterback left. Uh he hid a lot of issues the team had. Uh but and and it's, so it's easier to figure that out at that point. But yeah, I I think I agree. I think the Dolphins are in that situation where if Tua becomes the 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 star player that they hope he becomes that they've got the roster now to compete with just about any team in the league. Well, what I would say is, is I, I don't know that I qualify the roster as elite because you look at, like at a Buffalo or Kansas City, if we were to look at the AFC, for example, uh, maybe even Cleveland has three, four, five guys you would say are, are elite players at their position. You look at the Dolphins, and Xavier Howard clearly stands out. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I don't know that there's anybody else on that roster where right now you'd say that's an elite blue chip player, top three, top five at his position. Sure. What they do have is a lot of solid players everywhere. Um, but this is why I, I think it's not going to be good enough for just Tua to be okay or, or a game manager, which is what he was last year. I mean, I know a lot of the supporters point to the six and three record. Well, Tua was six and three because the defense kept coming up with turnovers. And because the special teams were were absolutely outrageous last year, that's not a formula. Number one, it's not a formula that's really going to win you a Super Bowl, um, and it's also a little bit difficult to sustain. Sure. So yeah, it, the onus is on him. I mean, based on everything we've seen right now, the off season that the Dolphins clearly made the commit, commitment to Tua. For 2021, now it's up to him to deliver. Yeah, what I probably want to see from the Dolphins is I want to see and make sure that they get more pressure. So, like Phillips, let's see him become that player that the team hopes he can become because that's important. They're going to be a championship team. They have got to, Phillips has got to be a big part of that in the next couple of years. Uh, and the offensive line, yeah, you know, the offensive line has got to grow and develop into a good line doesn't have to be great i think today today's nfl as long as you have an average offensive line that's where the elite quarterback comes in and then throw in all the other things that you talked about turnovers good special teams can make up for certain things but yeah i think for the dolphins i want i i think a little bit more pressure uh from players like phillips that can help down the road and definitely the offensive line because especially if you're not going to have that elite running back situation, you better have a really good offensive line. No, correct. And it wasn't, it wasn't great last year. No. And, but here's the thing in 2019, it was really bad. Uh, well, I was about to say brutal. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> uh, let's say it was uh, highly subpar yeah. last year. It was adequate. Well, this year it needs to be good because I mean, they've invested a lot of, 
draft capital in that line. We're talking Michael Dieter in the third round in 2019. Last year, Austin Jackson, Robert Hunt, Solomon Kindley. This year, Eichenberg. Uh, that's that's a lot of draft capital, and it needs to come through and take the next step. All right, what's uh, next for the Dolphins? It's going to be basically we have no idea about these mini camps, right? Still up in the air? Correct. I mean, um, can't get confirmation on whether there have been. I'm, I highly suspect they do have some veterans uh, at the offseason workouts, but uh, don't know exactly the number. They're going. They are going to be there for the June mini camp because that one's mandatory. So, uh, not quite sure. All right. Well, we'll definitely we'll definitely talk to you before training camp begins. So that's for sure. So. And I'll have the Explorers hat on. Uh, I can't wait. And I can't wait for, for you to get uh, Javon Hollins. Uh, I want to I hear whether or not he, w- he was, if he was old enough to be an Expo fan, or maybe somebody in his family could have been an Expo fan, I would think. Maybe his dad or mom. Maybe they were Expos fans. No, his dad played, the, played in the CFL, so that's possible. Okay, very nice. Good bloodlines. All right, Alan, great job as always. Appreciate it. Uh, can't wait to talk to you again next time because that means training camp will be upon us. And uh, and uh, that's uh, that's an awesome time of year as well. So uh, thanks for checking in with us, talking Miami Dolphins football. Oh, absolutely. I'll be looking forward to it.